Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to episode 2 of the Basaganan Trip Podcast. If you're just joining us, I'm rebooting this. This used to be a YouTube show that I would do live and now I'm doing it as a kind of interview format where I bring in some of the people who help me think differently about our society, about the Philippines. And yun yung tema naman talaga ng Basaganan Trip. Um, pag sinabi natin, binabasag natin yung trip ng mga tao, yung trip is yung kind of the way we think about the world and the, th- the ways we think about our country na napaka-fix, na hindi nagbabago na, kaya dapat basagin. So every week, I'm going to invite somebody who can help you think differently about your society and the world you live in and who can help me think differently about my society and the world I live in as well. So today, uh, for my second guest, I've invited someone na maraming best na niya nabasag yung trip ko because of his kind of unique perspective on society He's uh, another, like our first guest, Manolo, Manolo Quezon. He's also a columnist with the Philippine Daily Inquirer. Um, but he's a medical anthropologist. He's, that means he's a doctor. So he's an MD. He also has a PhD in anthropology. So kaya kanyang, kanyang gamutin ang iyong katawan, pero kaya niya ring gamutin ang iyong utak. So welcome to Basaganang Trip, my, my very good friend, Gideon Lasco. Salamat. Hello, Leloy. Hello, I'm glad that your podcast is back. So, unang una, Gideon, gusto ko lang tanongin yung medical anthropologist. Ano ba yun? At paano ka, paano ka magiging medical anthropologist? Well, medical anthropology is really a field that recognizes na yung mga medical issues natin, including COVID, dengue, HIV, and whatever else, cancer, all of these are actually culturally uh, constructed in the sense that we ascribe certain ideas with the way we deal with all of these conditions. Halimbawa na lang yung COVID. Diba? People interpreted it differently depending on where you are. People uh, sa, in our country, umabot sa mga face shield, face masks, being very strict, very draconian. And then in the U.S., for example, people apply their liberal libertarian notions about, no, this is my freedom, this is my body, I don't want to wear a mask. So, dun pa lang, makikita natin na it's not just a viral disease. It's a, it's a social phenomenon. And therefore, we have to look at how people respond to every single condition, uh, medically speaking. Kasi yung, yung mismong disease ng COVID-19, isa itong viral disease, di ba? So, yes. talagang illness ito. Pero yung the way we talk about it, the way we respond to it, kultura na natin yun, di ba? There's no one objective way to respond to it. And I think yun nga yung naging isa sa mga comments mo. Marami sa mga experts, hindi lang naman sa Pilipinas, kundi sa buong mundo, sinasabi na experts sila. So sila yung merong objective na katotohanan kung paano to deal with the virus. Yes, and even at the global level, diba, it was a political act to declare it a pandemic. Diba? A body, WHO, convened and decided at a certain day based on a certain criteria that this is now a pandemic. So that in itself, hindi natin pwede sabihin na virus lang yon. But there's a political decision to declare it as a pandemic, to declare quarantines, to declare lockdowns, etc., etc. Tsaka nagbabago historically, no? May, nabag- may nabasa nga ako isang papel. Usually nga ngayon sa globally, yung mga mahilig sa lockdown, mga left-wing. Sila yung mga left-wing yung mga unang mag- magpasara ng, nagpasara ng schools, for example. Sila yung ob- very cautious. Pero apparently, nung panahon ng Spanish flu, at least dito sa United States, yung mga left-wing, sila yung mga pinakaayaw magpasara ng mga eskwelahan during the Spanish mm-hmm. flu. Dahil, dahil sinasabi nila, kawawa naman yung mga bata kung hindi makapag-aral. Kahit magkasakit na yung ibang tao, basta maka, ma, 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 may pagpatuloy ng mga bata yung pag-aaral nila. So, cultural talaga, mismo yung pag-iisip ng left and yung right, nag-i, nag-iiba relative to a disease. Yeah, uh, so, but in the Netherlands, for example, they were very insistent na napakahalaga ng edukasyon ng mga bata. So, tuloy tayo kahit na merong risk of Omicron variant, for example. And sa atin, umiral yung kailang yung very infantilizing tayo and this goes back to American period diba the infantilization and we've seen this during covid na no the minors they have to stay at home they have to be protected they cannot even go outdoors for for the longest time on the other hand here in Mexico which interestingly left wing yung ano natin dito presidente dito si Lopez Obrador 
it was one of the most uh, liberal regimes in terms of COVID and never nag-impose ng lockdown dito sa Mexico. Mm. Ng Kasi quarantine. Iba yung, iba yung perception of how, how to protect our kids. Kasi sa Pilipinas, yung protect our kids, napaka-narrow in a way. Badly, dapat hindi magkasakit. Yun yung idea ng protection. Pero yung idea ng protection sa ibang bansa is in a way to protect their mental health, we have to protect mm-hmm. their you know their capa- their their ability to exercise their ability to play and of course yung education nila so yun yung kind of broader notion of health for kids diba yes. na umiiral and you were saying yun yung umiiral diyan sa Mexico sa inyo so, yes and <laughs> president well, ka well, na well, well, <laughs> well actually so that's where medical anthropology comes in so instead of just explaining this in terms of the politics we have to look at what are the cultural notions that inform the politics. So sa Pilipinas, I have argued na yung ating mga pananaw sa mga konsepto to, gaya ng hawa at resistensya, this is my work with Michael Tan, we looked at how notions of hawa and resistensya figured in how people imagine COVID. Mm-hmm. So hindi lang siya nakakahawa, pero kailangan pala kasi yung resistensya ng katawan. And that's why supplements, vitamin C, and even perhaps even ivermectin. This is why all of these uh, medicines resonated with many people. Kaya and, nauso sa atin. At saka kahit oh, yung pag, oh. pagpavitamins, ang hiling magvitamins sa mga Pilipino. Oo, oh, nasold out yung vitamin C in the first week of COVID. And that echoed what happened during SARS in the Philippines. Na ganun din yung, yung nangyari. And I have also seen, we have a forthcoming paper naman looking at loob and labas how the outdoor spaces were constructed as a dangerous uh, space in the Philipp- in Philippine public discourse and political discourse to a point that you can see uh, there's no difference in, in our IATF uh, regulations between indoor and outdoor spaces. Hanggang ngayon, ayaw nila, for example, ilift yung uh, wearing of face masks. Actually, I, I would agree with Gwen Garcia, the Cebu governor, in her argument na in outdoor spaces, pwede hindi magmask. But that was opposed by many people oh, across okay. the, the political spectrum. And that was unpalatable to most people because of, parang yun nga, there's no, dalabas is really problematized as dangerous. Naisip ko nga rin eh, kasi nung, sinabi, nung narinig ko na sinabi ni Governor Gwen na bawal na mag-face mask sa labas, akala ko uncontroversial yun kasi dito sa US, uh, late 2020, early 2021 pa lang, wala na nagmamask sa labas. So hindi ako sanay din sa pag-iisip sa Pilipinas na kahit hanggang sa labas pala kailangan mag-mask. Kasi nung una akong pumunta dyan after the pandemic, nag, hindi lang nag-face mask sa labas, nag-face shield din dun sa labas. So ibang-iba talaga yung kultura, cultural talaga. And yung kabanga, I think ni Gov Gwen dyan, hindi hindi science. Eh. It's, a, it's a kind of cultural attitude. Pero masasabi ba, na, ba natin na masama yun? Kung in a sense yung kultura natin is people feel more safe kung nagmamask sila sa labas. Well, and this is where the medical uh, side of me comes in. I'm concerned about exercise. I'm concerned about mm-hmm. non-communicable diseases. When I look at health, for me, we shouldn't just be measuring COVID cases. We should be looking broadly at how health is constructed and conceived. So, paano na yung mga diabetes? A lot of people are not able to exercise, are not able to go out, uh, are not encouraged to go out. And if you impose a lockdown, ano yung consequence ito sa mental health? The nutrition, for example, the people cannot work because they have no livelihood. All of these are equally important health outcomes, mm. and I believe that they should also be also be measured. Pero dun nga umiral ngayon ati mga pagtingin sa loob at labas. Uh, I have seen people, for example, na sa condo nila they're not wearing a mask. Pero paglabas, even though it's a shared condo, it's a condo building. They would not wear a mask inside because they feel that's a law of their house, their mm-hmm. residence. Pero paglabas na, cakaw mag magusot ng mask, and it's not. There's no uh, medical uh, support for that because most overwhelmingly, almost all of the infections that took place, transmission globally, were indoors. So walang evidence whatsoever to support an outdoor uh, outdoor transmission. That's why we need to be really encouraging. Mm-hmm. Uh, outdoor-friendly policies. Pero hindi yun yung nakikita natin hanggang ngayon sa Pilipinas. At meron medyo consistent ka dito, Gideon, kasi naalala ko, kasagsagan ng COVID, yung parang bago pa man mag-Delta, yung 2020 pa lang, when everyone was still very, very afraid of COVID, yung height ng pag-afraid ng COVID, sabi mo, we should go outdoors. No? Uh, 
saan ang galing yung tapang mo na sabihin na 2020 pa lang lumabas kayo ng bahay, go outdoors, go on hikes, mag-bike kayo? Well, maybe this also comes from my personal uh, background as an outdoors man, as a mountaineer that uh, I, re- I really love the outdoors. But at the same time, nga, I, I review the evidence and it shows na there's no support for that. And globally, the more technocratic uh, decision-making uh, countries were able to reach that conclusion uh, way ahead of, of the Philippines. So it took us so long to realize even that outdoor exercise should be supported. Uh, it's, there's no rocket science here, but just looking at health more holistically and looking beyond COVID as an outcome. So why not? Yeah. Can can you just tell us why should why should we go outdoors amidst this pandemic? Well, the outdoors offers so much in terms of uh, number one. I think mental health, also experiencing a mental health pandemic in the country as, mm-hmm. as all over the world, especially young people. As a mm-hmm. faculty of UP, I have met, sadly, mostly virtually. I have met students who are really. Uh, really feeling this kind of being trapped, this feeling of being locked in and locked down. And I think that being outdoors will allow them to, to feel better. And at the same time, the physical activity, uh, non-communicable diseases are on the rise in, in the Philippines, in hypertension, diabetes, etc. And they need also this kind of being there. And for our children, especially, the formative years of play Diba? Alam naman natin yan in the, the social sciences, even in history, that play plays a big role in uh, development of children. So if you remove those things, and this falls along lines of privilege, by the way, because kahit na mag-lockdown ka at stay at home, home means very differently uh, between someone who has a very large lot, di ba? Mm. from a, in a gated subdivision yes, yes. And, and someone who is told to stay at home na ang bahay mo lang is a small uh, condo unit or even being part of a small uh, barangay na dikit-dikit. So this has differential consequences depending on uh, where you are in Philippine society as well. Napakadali so na sabihin sa mayaman mag-lockdown ko kung may swimming uh-oh. sa bahay mo, di ba? Exactly. Lang, sige. Exactly. Exactly. This is uh, something that people should realize na parang for them, okay lang, okay lang to stay at home. Dito na lang muna tayo. But if you have a basketball court, if you have if you have a large lawn for your kids to play, ibang-iba yung kalagayan mo as compared to the majority of Filipinos who will not have that kind of privilege. That's why it was, I, I felt it was a, one of my priorities in terms of advocacy at the beginning of the pandemic to really advocate for uh, outdoor play. Yeah, yeah, let, let, let the children play. I, I like what you said about play, no? Because uh, the reason also why I like the idea of play because dun, hindi ka lang nage-exercise dun, nasosocialize din yung mga bata dun, eh, diba? Dun yeah. sila natututo kung paano makituro yung sa mga ibang bata. Nagkakaroon sila ng empathy, for example, makita nila ng bada pa yung, ka, yung, yung kalaro nila, pwede nilang tulungan, diba? And they're also able to test the limits of their bodies. You know, kung pagod na ako, alam nila kung kailan sila titigil, alam nila kung ano yung delikado para sa kanila. And uh, children are obviously very resilient and yung resiliency na yun comes from yung open-ended exploration, diba? Uh, one of the attributes of play is wala siyang purpose, Mm-hmm. Hindi mo sinasabi mm-hmm. maglaro ka para makascore ka ng 30 points sa basketball. Sinasabi mo lang maglaro ka para maglaro ka and in itself yung playing eh. And uh, yun nga yung nawawala sa atin lalo na ngayon, 'di ba, na meron tayong internet, meron tayong mga iPad, din naglalaro yung mga bata sa kalsada. And I think one reason for this is also yung mga magulang, uh, marami tayo ngayong mga helicopter parent, 'di ba? Helicopter mm-hmm. parent meaning yung idea na pag may konting problema yung anak mo, papasok ka in a helicopter, tutulungan mo yung bata. One of the uh, lines I love the most is, don't prepare the road for your kids. Prepare your kids for the road. Kasi hindi mo naman mm-hmm. mapabago yung hinaharap nila. Ikaw, uh, so, so I mean, n- neither of us are parents. Hindi natin alam uh, kung paano magkaroon ng anak. Pero uh, we can imagine how a number of our Filipino parents now are afraid for their children to play. Uh, what would you tell these parents amidst this, this pandemic? Why, why should you, you know, bakit kailan buo yung li- loob nila at pag- hayaan nila maglaro yung mga anak nila? Well, in the first place, uh, 
actually in terms of COVID risk, napakababa nga even less for for children as compared to to adults. But it is the pero hindi sila yung pinakawaling ma-vaccinate, diba? And it, that's because they're really perceived as vulnerable. That there are different different studies required para safe ba yung vaccine for children. Mm. But ironically, it's their very concern about children's safety that has placed them in this vulnerability that they, they can't get, go out. And there are, I would point to the long-term consequences of, of all of these things that are, that are happening. Uh, locking down on children, forcing them to stay at home. This will have impacts long-term, incalculable, intangible impacts in terms of their development. And we have to really watch out for that. For example, lang, ano yung mga impact na yun sa development ng bata na nabasa? Well, well the, because of the unprecedented impact of, of the pandemic, we don't actually have uh, rigorous studies that, that are based on COVID itself. But based on developmental pediatrics, that the overwhelming evidence that points to the form- formativeness of the early years in terms of psychomotor skills, social skills. Mm-hmm. So if, if these are lost and if this is not being able to uh, be supported to its fullest, magkakaroon ng ano, I fear. And I would like to add also the fact na we haven't had full face-to-face classes until now. And we're one of the few countries to to have this kind of educational lockdown. Naganitong ka protracted. I was surprised, for example, when our friend Sheila Coronel uh, told me that in New York they only really stopped having face-to-face classes for one semester. Mm. And wow, for me, wow, that's such a big uh, difference from our policies that I feel were really based more on this this cultural concern about children as vulnerable more than anything else, mm. more than the, the actual concern about uh, the virus. They would invoke, oh, but we have the lowest, uh, our, vac- our vaccines are not that good, etc. But pero dito na nga papasok sana yung outdoor. We could have mobilized outdoor spaces, di ba? Why stop people from in Batanes, for example, for holding cl- from holding classes outdoors or oh. so many other places in the country hindi naman Ilalim ang bumbansa. Ilalim ng puno ng mangga, di ba? Yes. yes. Actually, uh, napaka-good atmosphere ngayon. Feel uh-oh. ko mas marami pa matututunan yung mga bata doon kasi pwede sila maglaro habang, habang nag-aaral, di ba? Kasi yung idea rin natin ng education is nakapaku yung mga bata sa mga upuan nila, makikinig sila for 30 minutes to an hour. Yun yung education. But actually, there's a point, there, meron ding education na naglalakad, naglalaro, di ba? And in, in fact, nga, sa various places, uso na ngayon yung mobile desks or at the very least yung stand-up desks para pwedeng gumalaw yung mga bata habang nag-aaral. Kasi malikot talaga ang bata eh. Absolutely. And another uh, failure, I think, is to is to refuse to imagine the Philippines as heterogeneous uh, policies that are applicable mostly for Metro Manila uh, context mm. was ap- applied uh, as a whole, di ba? As applied uh, without discriminating between different contexts mm. in the Philippines. Para later on na lang na nagkaroon ng konting uh, flexibility and iterativeness uh, in the part of, of the government. So, nag-evolve naman yung response and eventually, DOH embrace outdoor and rin, encourage people to go outdoors. Pero, very slow yung, yung development. It took so long for the face shields, for example, to be finally eliminated. And until now, technically, it can still be restored. It's oh, okay. alert level 3 and up. So, andun pa rin siya, actually. Andun pa rin. So, magbalik tanaw tayo. Yun nga, uh, ilang beses mo na rin nasabi, ang bagal mag-adapt ng government response. In a way, the word you can use is conservative. Di ba? Or extra conservative. Um, that's actually putting it nicely. Uh, uh, worse way of putting it would be authoritarian or, or 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 even worse unscientific right so whatever adjective you want to use um the question is bakit nga ang bagal bakit ang bagal ng learning curve ng gobyerno natin well part of it is really this overarching concern towards uh being safe diba parang better safe Duterte in, in his, if you look at his speeches throughout the pandemic he would use that na parang okay na to. Uh, manood na lang muna kayo ng mga TV, yung mga bata. Mm-hmm. He would appeal to parents, parang stay at home na lang. So part of it was informed of that. I would also think that 
very clinical yung naging approach ng mga so mga experts natin in government. They, many of them are well-meaning and I refuse to cast aspersions at our many of our uh, health experts who were part of the advisory group that uh, gave input to IATF. But I feel that their weakness was they're coming mostly from a hospital perspective and hindi naman lahat ng applicable sa hospital, applicable sa sa buong mundo or sa buong bansa. Diba? The world is not a hospital, the country is not a hospital. Pero malani mga policies na medyo clinical yung or- orientation. And I would argue also, and this is, I'm a doctor, so in a way, this is a self-denigrating uh, uh, <laughs> argument. But I think med- medicine is authoritarian in nature as well. You mean medicine as a whole? Meron ganong tendency medicine, ang medicine. Medicine sa Pilipinas. Medicine as a whole. As an or- Kasi if you're a doctor, you're not used to the patient uh, talking back to you and saying, no, I don't like this uh, medicine. Uh, mm-hmm. Gusto ko iba yung inamin ko. But there's an assumption among many doctors for the good and therefore they have the right to be authoritarian. They have the right to impose. And it's a crisis anyway. There's no time for consultation. Diba? Parang if you're in the ER, hmm. if you're in the operating room, you cannot, you cannot convene a committee to decide what to do. You have to decide right away. So there are, by the nature of the field, of, of the discipline, and you, you yourself hmm. have been surrounded by, by doctors in your life, right? <laughs> oh, oh. so, but, but, so what can you say about this, na, what I'm saying? Na I feel that there's a tendency. I'm not, I'm not saying that it's uh, always applied, but I think that me- med- medicine itself has an authoritarian tendency. Well, uh, I won't call. I, I I grew up with parents of doctors, pero like you, you know, my mother also had a PhD in the social sciences, so hindi narrow clinical perspective. So I I grew up um, in a family of doctors, but I grew up in a family where that critique was also present. Pero ako yung na pagtanto ko is sometimes yung the worst doctors, not my parents. My parents are great doctors. My the worst doctors, meron silang habit of uh, ito yung pill mo, go away. Parang ganun. Doc, masakit yung likod ko. Ito, gamot, alis ka. Mm-hmm. Di ba? Mm-hmm. So, parang, parang in a way, naisip ko yung sa COVID pandemic. Baka may ganun ding sense yung parang, ah, ito na yung solusyon, gawin mo na lang. Here's your pill. And then, report to me once everything yeah. better already. Parang, and then they're using that logic and, and applying it on a societal level, which is different because so society is all, you're already talking about culture, you're already talking about politics, you're already talking about economics. So, hindi siya nga yung, yung, ano, yung clinical setting na alam ng mga doktor. Exactly. Writ large, the, the clinical setup can be really dangerous. Uh, it doesn't reflect the complexity of society and the different uh, settings. Uh, obviously, what's applicable to someone who's very sick in the hospital doesn't apply to the whole population where it's a, it's a mix of people who are not even at risk or very low risk, people who are, are at high risk. Obviously, you have to have some different uh, kinds of policies for, for different groups. Pero hindi ba kasalanan din natin bilang mga pasyente or kasalanan namin bilang mga pasyente? Yes, doc lang din kasi kami ng yes, doc. Well, that's why we have to also take a historical approach about uh, how all of these came to be. And, and that's where cultural history plays a, a very big role. Uh, in the history of medicine in the Philippines, we can say na talagang very uh, paternalistic in medicine, all the way back to uh, out of Warwick Anderson, for example, of colonial pathologies uh, in the U.S., uh, colonial regime. Ganun din yung pagtingin sa medicine. It is an instrument of civilization and therefore, sumunod na lang, sumunod na lang kayo. And I feel that... Back up lang tayo ng konti doon. When you say may colonial history in authoritarian medicine, sinasabi mo yung mga doktor na Amerikano, sinasabi nila kayong mga Pilipino, madudumi kayo dahil madumi kayo, sakitin kayo. Ito yung gagawin namin, sumunod na lang kayo. So, so in other words, yes. itinutuloy na marami mga doktor ngayon sa Pilipinas yung kind of authoritarian colonial history ng medicine na yun. I would I would I would argue uh, that, that yes oh mm. but of course there's been a pushback uh, even within the medical profession very heterogeneous din ang ating uh, public health sector and we have had a, a very healthy uh, since the 1970s I would say 
uh, uh, public health activism and community, the community medicine practitioners. There's been a, some healthy activism within the public health sector. And uh, just last week or a few a few weeks ago, I think they even filed a case against Zimbadoy for, for red tagging and they filed for her to be revoked yung kanyang PRC license. So we have, we have doctors who are uh, really passionate about about seeing health as political, but seeing also the government itself as something that they should not shy away from in terms of intervening and making their voices heard. Mm -hmm. But it will take a while because the cultural change is not just coming from the profession. It's also coming from the patients themselves, diba? And I think from the patients themselves, laging merong takot na matawag na pasaway. And this is not just a medical issue, diba? Um, it's a it's a government and political issue kung hindi ka sumusunod dun sa great leader, pasaway ka. Kung hindi ka sumusunod dun sa doktor, pasaway ka. Lagi kang takot. So kung gusto mo pakitan tao, make sure na sumunod ka ng sumunod. Uh, if that means na magpe-face shield ako at magpe-face mask ako kahit outdoors ako, so be it. Kasi nakakatakot maging magpasaway. Actually, yung one thing na ikinagulat ko dun sa Pilipinas nung dumating ako dyan, first time since the pandemic, nagda-drive ako, may mga tao sa kotse nila mag-isa naka-face mask, naka-face shield. Sa loob ng kotse nila, wow, right, mag-isa okay. sila. Oo. Oh. Okay. Oo. Yeah, di ba? Uh, how many people have been discouraged to go out because of these kinds of policies? And if you count the cost of that in terms of our economy, in terms of public health, mm -hmm. yun yung, these are just one of the things that, to go back to what I was saying earlier, these are the incalculable uh, and unmeasured uh, outcomes that are, are not being uh, considered in our policies. Pero balikan, hope, lang, yeah. balikan lang natin yung notion na yun ng pasaway, no? Uh, pwedeng pabulaan na mo na ngayon yung sinasabi ng mga tao kaya, mar nagka kaya tumataas yung mga kaso sa Pilipinas. Every time tumaas yung kaso sa Pilipinas, maraming magsasabi dahil kasi maraming pasaway. Totoo ba yun? Is that even scientifically valid? Well, the surveys uh, show in fact that Filipinos are among the most compliant in terms of all of these public protocols. We were, were one of the highest, we have the highest rates of mask wearing Etc. So you can say, and I think that in terms of my travels, I, I've been to parts of Latin America throughout the pandemic, uh, Peru, uh, Colombia, and now in Mexico, I've been to the US several times. So I can say that talagang sa Pilipinas, uh, iba yung pagsusuot ng, ng mask. People Hindi are really... Hindi pasaway. Hindi talaga. And, and this pasaway discourse, actually, it shifts the blame, eh. That's what's dangerous about this kind of this mm -hmm. is that it creates a, a group of people to blame for the pandemic when in fact kailangan natin is vaccination uh, this structural responses that this so-called pasaway had nothing to do with and but pero sila CDC said diba? In, ensuring access to vaccination addressing vaccine hesitancy boosting the healthcare capacity para kung may magkasakit, eh, hindi may So th this is hardly the, the fault of the Pasaway. And these are the ones that are causing our, our problems in terms of public health. So, so it's not an acceptable discourse to me. There are, there are people who are uh, Pasaway, but they're not to blame for the, the rise of cases. And even if those who are forced to be pasaway, we have to look at why they are uh, having to, for example, to break quarantine in the first place. Baka naman wala silang trabaho dahil walang tulong man lang na binibigay sa kanila yung gobyerno, kaya sila napipilitang lumabas. So we have to look at the reasons why people seem to be pasaway in the first place, especially those who are in positions of vulnerability economically and socially. I couldn't help but draw a comparison between yung sinasabi mo at yung mga sinasabi ng tao related to the problems of drugs. Kasi ganyan din naman yung mga advocate, for example, ng drug wars. Sabi nila, ang dami kasing pasaway, kaya kailangan patayin or kailangan you know, yariin yung mga user kasi sila yung pasaway. When in fact, the problem of drugs is, is a structural problem. So am I, am I correct in saying na yung discourse for authoritarian drug war in yung discourse for 
authoritarian approach to COVID. May may may, may relationship yung dalawang discourse yun. Absolutely, the the addict and the pasaway are one and the same person. This is the so-called dangerous other that is being painted as the villain of society, when in fact they are the victim. Oftentimes, they're victims of government's failure to, to, to support their communities. So in the case of drugs, in my own ethnographic work, nakita ko na kaya maraming gumagamit ng shabu. And I, I, nakitambay talaga ako sa kanila. This was before Duterte's administration, 2011 to 2014, in my ethnographic work. I have seen how people use shabu as some kind of pampagilas or energy booster in the many kinds of jobs they engage in. And they're willing to, to let go of this kind of, of life given the opportunity, but they are caught in this informal economy where they, have, they feel that they're compelled to use uh, Shabu. So, and this is just one context out of many na nakikita natin na hindi talaga, hindi talaga uh, factual yung sinasabi na parang the discourse of, of the addict as the societal danger. Pero unfortunately, even, even our different sectors of society, from media to for the longest time, the church, have participated in this discourse. Na sinisisi nila yung addict eh. Kung merong, every time merong rape na nangyari. Addict yung may kasalanan. Kasabihin ng mga rape dito commentators. Malamang yan. Kasi sino ba namang capable na gumawa ng gantong karumaldumal kung di mga addict? Hmm. So, so instead of blaming... So yeah... So 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 instead of blaming the addict or instead of blaming the pasaway na nagkaroon siya ng covid dahil lumabas siya once uh, kailangan natin tignan yung mga sistema and uh, both with respect to covid and also with respect to drugs I've heard experts talk about this notion of harm reduction is is that something is that the kind of discourse you're plugged into and is that a discourse you agree with Gideon Well, of course, I, I really support looking at, uh, first of all, I, I don't believe in a drug-free world. I believe that, that we all use drugs one way or the other, whether it's And coffee, ca- caffeine is a drug. Hmm. After all, diba? alcohol is also a drug. So I would argue, and I, I would argue strongly that drugs are actually part of human life. And that's been the case from the very beginning. Societies have used psychoactive substances since time immemorial, from yung mga psychoactive, yung mga religious rituals, di ba? mga incense, mga in different societies that all of these uh, th- these plants that were used, some, many of them have psychoactive properties. And we have carried over many of these things in our everyday life from our consumption of coffee and alcohol. Uh, you do not arrest people for smoking cigarettes, although that's being increasingly criminalized also for public health grounds. But obviously, killing people just because they use a certain kind of uh, substance is not a, an approach that we should take. We should look at the actual harms that are caused by, by the substances rather than automatically uh, thinking that simply because someone uses those, they, they, they don't deserve to live or they have to be jailed. Sa atin, uh, even just a few sticks of marijuana. Technically, you can be jailed for several years in, in the Philippines. The possession of a very small amount. Ganun ka, ka punitive yung ating mga batas patungkol sa mga drugs. And that that's, doesn't reflect the reality of drug use around the world and in the country. At ganun din ka punitive yung COVID response. Even until now, yung idea actually ng granular lockdown Akala natin mas uh, babalik. I'm just gonna toggle back and forth between these two issues because I think they're so related. We think that the issue of a granular lock, good na nag-granular lockdown na lang tayo kasi targeted, hindi na lahat nila lockdown. Pero kung tignan mo kung sino yung na lockdown, syempre yung mga may hirap. At uh, pag nilockdown mo yung mahirap, ang gagawin mo, i-deploy mo yung police, papaligiran mo sila at yayariin mo sila kung umalis sila doon, di ba? Hindi naman mm-hmm. siguro papatayin. Pero, you know, like, I'm sure they'll be punitive if you try to leave that granular lockdown. And ultimately, it doesn't work, lalo na in the age of Omicron, where, you know, this virus spreads so easily. Yes. 
but it works politically because people think you're doing something. So dito ba pasok yung sinasabi natin ang medical populism. Making a spectacle out of your response to COVID, it may not, it doesn't work uh, in terms of public health. It doesn't work in terms of upholding human rights and human dignity. But politically, it works. And Duterte has remained popular even up to the very end of his term. Mm, sabi, nga ni, sabi nga nila maraming mga populists sa buong mundo after COVID, dahil hindi sila nakinig sa science, bumaba yung kanilang popularity or yung rating sila. Si Donald Trump natanggal. Si Bolsonaro mukhang matatanggal dahil sa COVID response. Pero si Duterte, well, hindi naman siya pwedeng ma-elect ulit. Pero ang taas pa rin ang rating niya. Kahit na... Objectively, very few people I think will say na excellent yung response niya to COVID. Uh, because again, I think he was able to externalize the problem. Hindi ko kasalanan, kasalanan ng mga pasaway. Definitely, that's a, that's a part of it, di ba? Na the, the pasaway narrative has become successful and not just because it's the third time has been spreading that narrative, but people actually subscribe to it and they themselves believe in it. Uh, when the Dolomite Beach, for example, was opened, and I have, from an environmental perspective, I object to, to that kind of beach as a superficial kind of cleanliness. But, oh, sige, good, people are going out. But there was a moral panic about parent children. Why are children allowed to go to this beach? And they even banned people from going there. So, merong ganon. Merong ganong streak of people themselves seeing that we need a tough approach to COVID. Mm -hmm. And that's just something that's top down, but it's also something that's shared by by many Filipinos in the same way that the response to drugs is not just a Duterte invention. People have been lobbying for a tough approach to drugs from since the 1970s. Mm. The Catholic Church in uh, 1971, 1972, they were calling for the what they call the highest punishment or the toughest punishments. If you look at comment col columns in the 1990s, early 2000s, they're wondering, Bakit, apaka, ano natin? why are we so soft on these addicts? So it's not just Duterte. It's really a decade-long moral panic around drugs. And that's why it's so successful. That's why it's so successfully deployed. And that's the same with COVID as well. That it also comes from the people. Yung ganong question ng desire for this tough measure. Gusto natin din disiplina tayo. Kaya gustong gusto natin yung disciplinarian as head of state. Um, and so my sense is that all of these are narratives. Um, there's a narrative about the pasaway. There's a narrative about the tatay na nagdisiplina. Um, and what we need to do to challenge this policy, these policies, is not just to say that these policies are wrong, mali sila on a scientific level, hindi sila gumagana. We also need to challenge these policies by telling different stories about ourselves as Filipinos and ourselves as members of this political community. So, think about Gideon. What kind of new stories can we tell that will be more empowering than these previous stories that we've talked about? Well, we have to begin by recognizing that we, as a nation, we within our country. We have a diversity of, of people that belong to to our nation, and we cannot act petty. We cannot act as though we are a petty uh, a petty people or we, what I call what we are a small country. We have to recognize that our history is full of of richness, full of diversity, full of so many uh, stories of resistance and heroism and we cannot fill ourselves with, with this homogeneous notion of, of who we are as a people because that's poisonous that can lead us to to be vulnerable to authoritarian narratives of for example nationalism that, that doesn't exist so i think we really have, have to go back to our history not as a kind of yung ginagawa ng iba, di ba? that they look at a golden age Age, for example, a Marcus Golden Age, but we have to draw from our history a kind of dignity that comes from our uh, diversity of, of culture, diversity of peoples within the country.
Wala naman kasing golden age, di ba? Regardless of which part of Philippine history you look at, may mga malalaking palpak at may mga malalaking kagalingan. So it's not a matter of focusing on a particular period and saying we draw inspiration exclusively from this period. It's about looking at those various moments in different parts of history uh, and looking at different Filipinos who have lived different lives at different moments in our history and seeking inspiration from from those, right? And and this is yeah. like, what allows you to have an alternative perspective on our culture. Yeah, I think kasi na para for the longest time and even in academia, it's been framed there's a streak of thinking that frames the Philippines as parang tayo yung oppressed mm-hmm. and that we have to fight these Western nations. But where does places like Mexico fall under that kind of thinking, for example, na parang in Spanish period ba, is it just Spain versus the Philippines? Paano na yung, yung mga ibang bansa within the Spanish Empire who also challenged Spain but was also part of our history, mm-hmm. like Mexico nga, na we brought so many things to Mexico, including the technology to make tequila. Hmm. So yung mga Filipino so, sailors uh, traveled and then they influenced parts of Mexico as well. So very heterogeneous yung ating history. Eh. It shouldn't be framed in terms of these binaries of oppressor versus oppressed and Filipino well, versus Dark Western. Oh. Yes, oh, oh. So, yeah, so yung ganun mga dichotomies have to be broken if we are to uh, move forward in terms of our thinking. So yaman lamang na nabanggit mo na Gideon that there are good things in dark places, nice things, in, uh, ba- bad things in good places. Today, when you look at the Philippines, what's, what, do you, what do you like as a medical anthropologist? What kind of changes do you like? I know that's a really broad question, but um, I just want to kind of close this inter- towards the end of this interview. And I want to talk about nice things. Well, what's nice about our country is the fact that we've never lost this tradition of, of resistance. People have always fought for what they feel is right. And we can see that thread running through our history from the times of uh the Spanish period, di ba? Hindi lang naman nag-umpisa yung revolution in the, ni- in the late 19th century, but there's always been kind of mga Basi re- revolt, etc. So there's always been a notion within our people of fighting for what is right, di ba? Yung tama, eh, pinaglalaban yung tama. And until now, we see that in places like Bukidnon where I've met uh, forest guards fighting for the forest. In Kitanglad, I've met that among parang NGOs in Puerto Princesa where they're fighting for the protection of, of their environment. And we see that, of course, in the public health sector as well, where we have doctors to the barrios and health activists who are fighting for uh, the health of their community. So this may not be something that's bro- as broad as fighting for economic development or democracy, but in many ways, People have always been fighting for uh, something in, in their community. And I just listened to Bong Bong Marco's speech and then said he, he built other windmills. Diba? So that led me to think about windmills as a, as a topic for my column, clean energy. And even then, I, I've seen uh, people resist windmills in Sagada, for example, dahil parang baka disturb daw yung bundok sa kanila. So we see people have always, despite the political exigencies, despite the political threats, people, uh, there's been a tradition in country for fighting for what they believe is right. And I think it's just a matter of recognizing those notions of justice that we, we can build solidarity with each other. It's just a matter of really finding more of these stories and making them uh, part of our narrative. But by the way, uh, na fact check nga pala yung ano windmills, private partnerships pala yung windmills. Yung sinabi niya kasi I built them. Actually, exactly. Namin niya mismo in an ANC interview that those are not government projects. So just, just a reminder, but I think it's good to talk about windmills. Um, both exactly. Both metaphorical and real windmills. Um, as Filipinos, uh-huh. we're always tilting against windmills um, in, in the kind of metaphorical sense, as you said. Yeah, and and then din yung desire for progress. The, the fact that the windmills were used successfully used as a symbol, and like you said, there's really no basis for saying that he built them. But the fact that he successfully used it as a symbol 
can be interpreted as people actually looking forward to some kind of progress. Uh, nakikita ko na pwede makita natin in this coming administration as a kind of scientific populism. Hmm. In the sense that nuclear plants, and all of these so supposedly scientific uh, tokens, we might see more of them being uh, a feature of the coming administration. But regardless, I think that we can interpret them as a the fact that they resonate to people means that there's a desire for, for, for something better. Yeah. And I think yung appeal talaga ng Marcos campaign is yung, yung opposition and yun, you know, I was I, I'm a fan of the opposition. I voted for Lenny Robredo. i a big fan of Lenny Robredo. But if you look at her campaign, it's her campaign was mostly um, good governance, malinis kami, and therefore mapag, mapapagtiwa, magpapagkatiwalaan nyo kami. Pero yung Marcos is, well, maybe you don't necessarily trust me, but I have a vision for Filipino greatness, which is... Which is which is which is I think it's it's appealing to a country that has always, as you said, thought of itself as small. Diba? Parang Filipinos are small, but then here comes a leader who says, actually, we're not small. We're a great country. We can even be a prosperous country. And so there's an appeal there, and that's why most of the people who voted for Ferdinand Marcos Jr. voted for him. Eight eight percent lang yung bumoto sa kanya because they thought he was not corrupt. Eight percent lang. The majority, mm-hmm. yung number one reason for voting for him was because they thought he could do something, right? So yung kind of more active vision of what society can be. And that can be an opening for uh, activism as well. That we need to hold him to, to account. Because even the people who voted for him will expect something mm-hmm. uh, out of this administration. And that's an opening for us to uh, to hold him accountable. Akala ko ba, you win mills ka. So what... Nasaan yung clean energy plan natin? Hmm. Uh, akala ko ba, sabi mo sa administration na ganito, PGH or roads, infrastructure, where is it? So that can be opening for people to, to hold him accountable, even though we're not sure whether he cares, but at least we, we can try to keep holding officials accountable regardless. Okay, Gideon, we're about to close now, pero si, si Bea Kupin, who also started her own podcast, Sa Rappler, the way she closed her interview with me, she said, um, is, uh, she asked me, like, what are you reading now? What are you cons- what kind of media are you consuming now? So um, maybe Anna, I want to end with that. What, what can you recommend people to read and to listen to these days? Well, I've been reading a lot of uh, Philippine literature, actually, uh, contemporary Philippine literature. I've been reading the works of Carol Howe, the short stories of Carol nice. Howe uh, coming into Mexico, and then Sarge La Cuesta as well. Ako rin, I have, no, I, I have a collection of, of, of his short stories. So it's really good to, and it goes back to your question earlier of what can we do to expand our notion of nationhood. I think we have to really immerse ourselves more and in our literature, in our art, malaki yung role ng ating creatives in, in the coming years. And that we have to expand also our notion of what that means to include mga creators in the internet, etc. But I, I really draw inspiration from, from all of them, from our writers. And Gideon, I, I draw inspiration from you as one of our writers. Uh, Gideon Lasco, thank you very much for joining Basaga ng Trip. It was a pleasure. Thank you, Leloy. Thank you.